Abigail's married to a fool. Okay. We'll call him Brother N for short. <laughs> and uh, Brother N is a real idiot. He had all these sheep and all this, all this land and all these resources. And David and his, his army needed some help. So they sent word with a bunch of compliments, a bunch of goodies and all of that. Please, you know, allow us, you know, share some of what you got with us. And he's like, well, you know, what am I supposed to be the bank? In essence, that's what he says. So he, uh, he basically sloughs David and his men off. And his wife hears about it. Now she knows about David and his temper. So she knows what's coming next. And she is a wise woman, the Bible says. And we're going to start at verse 17. Now, therefore, know and consider that what thou wilt do. For evil is determined against our master and against all his house. For he is such as a son of Belial, that a man cannot speak to him. In other words, he's so stupid, he's so foolish that nobody can talk sense to him. Now, because he's stuck on stupid. That's my take on it, okay? Verse 18. Father, bless this word in Jesus' name. And Abigail made haste and took 200 loaves and two bottles of wine and five sheep ready dressed and five measures of parched corn and a hundred clusters of raisins and 200 cakes of figs and laid them on asses. And she said unto her servants, go on before me, behold, I come after you. But she told not her husband, neighbor, oh, his name is Nabal, Nabal, okay. And it was so, as she wrote on the ass that she came down by the covert of the hill and behold, David and his men came down against her and she met him. She saw that army coming and tear their, their stuff up. Now David had said, surely in vain have I kept all that this fellow hath in the wilderness. In other words, I've been nice to this guy and kept all his stuff safe for nothing. So that nothing was missed out of all that pertained unto him and he hath requited me evil for good. So, and more also do God unto the enemies of David. If I leave of all that pertain to him by the morning light, any that pissed against the wall. <laughs> so in other words, he said, there'll be no crumbs left of ever anybody knowing he ever existed. Now, and when Abigail saw David, she hasted and lighted off her ass, fell before him on her face, she humbled herself, y'all. Listen to that. And bowed herself to the ground. Mm -hmm. And fell at his feet and said unto him, My Lord, upon me let this iniquity be, and let thine handmaid, I pray thee, speak in thine audience, and hear the words of thine handmaid. Oh, she begging, she copping a plea now. Let not my Lord, I pray thee, regard this man of Belial, even Nabal, for as his name is, so is he. In other words, his name means he's a fool and he is a fool. All right. Now, let's go on down to verse 26. Now, therefore, my Lord, as the Lord liveth and as thy soul liveth, seeing the Lord hath withholden thee from coming to shed blood, and from avenging thyself with thine own hand, now let thine enemies and they that seek evil to my Lord be his neighbor. And now this blessing which thine handmaid hath brought unto thy Lord, let it even be given unto the young men that follow my Lord. She brought food and resources and all kind of goodies for David and his men. I pray thee, forgive the trespass of thine handmaid, for the Lord will certainly make the Lord a sure house because my Lord fighteth the battles of the Lord. She's saying he's blessed because he's fighting for the Lord. Okay. And evil hath not been found in thee all, the, all thy days. Yet a man is risen to pursue thee, to seek thy soul. But the soul of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of life. 
with the Lord thy God and the soul of thine enemies, them shall he sling out as out of the middle of a sling. He'll sling them out of existence. And it shall come to pass when the Lord shall have done to my Lord according to all the good that he hath spoken concerning thee and shall have appointed thee ruler over Israel that this shall be, there shall be no grief unto thee nor offense of heart. And he goes on and on. She's copping a plea. She wants him to remember her household and all that. Now, check this out. David was moved when he saw this and he granted her her request because she granted them their need. She met their need in spite of her husband. She didn't tell her husband. She didn't, the, that night he got drunk and she didn't tell him till the next day and his heart sunk in him when he realized what a fool he had been. But here's the funny part. Now I'm, now I'm telling the story. God saw to it that Nabal's days ended very quickly, soon after that. And now Abigail is a widow. And what did David do? David sent his messengers to let her know he wanted her to be his queen, his wife. And she became the wife of David because she was wise. Listen, when the Bible says, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will raise you up. That woman went from being married to a fool to being married to a king because she humbled herself. She was not in the wrong. Her husband was. But she, who wasn't even wrong, humbled herself nonetheless. Now listen. I know some of you have heard the expression, your attitude will determine your altitude. Some of you on YouTube, will not go far, will not be able to be sent by God to the high places of life because your attitude is too low. Your attitude is too earthbound. You're given to your emotions. Something goes wrong over here and you're ready to cuss somebody out. Something goes wrong over there and you're ready to put your foot where the sun don't shine. Something goes wrong behind you and you're ready to stab the person that's stabbing you in your back. And you think it's okay because they're wrong and you're right. But it ain't about who's wrong and right. It's about how you handle it. Life happens. People happen. People do you wrong. All kind of crap goes down. Number one, you must Forgive anyway, for your sake, not theirs. Number two, you must humble yourself and ask God, what role did you play in it if things go south? And if God does not give you a word of correction, then do not think more highly of yourself because you're right and they're wrong. Humble yourself to God and ask him for his mercy and for a swift, smooth, painless way of escape. Only God can get you out of some messes now. And he can get you out way quicker than your mouth. God can get you out of mess a whole lot quicker than your attitude. God can put out a whole lot more fires in your life then your anger. See, your temper can set things on fire. You can ruin things for yourself. You can have an opportunity, a door sitting wide open in front of you. And you could be thinking the devil is on your tail. Nope, it ain't the devil. You're thinking the person is stabbing you in your back. Nope person ain't stabbing you in the back. Well, what happened? You know, what's up with this? What's going on? You. 
your lip because you have not learned. I'm talking to some of you now, not all of you, because but God will show you who you are. As uh, Geraldine used to say, the ugly people know who they is. Some of you have a lip that you have not learned to bridle yet. James chapter 3 talks about bridling the tongue. The tongue is set like a, it, 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 it'll set a little spark. What a great matter of little fire kindling. You set off a brush fire just by opening your mouth out of season. You know the person gets on your last nerve. You know the person did you wrong. You know the person did poor judgment and you got to pay the piper for it. You know the person is against you. So you know the person is, go is taking you through changes. You know they're wrong. But you do not have to have a foul attitude. You really don't. What did Abigail do? When you look at the Israelites in the wilderness, and they sent out the spies, the 12 spies, to spy out the land. Ten came back with the wrong attitude, didn't they? They should have kept their mouths shut. When he said, do you think we're able? They could have said, well, the Lord has spoken and kept their mouths shut, even if they didn't believe it. Shut up! Caleb and Joshua were the only two that made it into the promised land that got their inheritance. Why? Because they did not voice their doubt. They said, surely as God has said, we're well able. They confirmed, they agreed with God rather than their own fears. The other people said, we saw ourselves as grasshoppers in our own eyes. They basically null and voided the contract God had with them. And they did not get to enter into the promised land. Why? Because of that little flapper flapping between those lips. Hmm. Think about it. How many blessings have we canceled out of our lives by what we said against God? Be careful what you say. It's hard enough believing, but don't voice how much you don't believe. Keep that to yourself. Now, some of you, you got things getting ready to go down. Now, I want to share something that I remembered years ago. There was a man in our church who used to talk like this. So comical. He went with a friend of his to go buy a car. And I overheard it because I was with them. This was crazy. Now, the person invited the person to come and try to convince this guy who he happened to know to, to, to give them credit. This was back in the day when the car dealership could make that choice more than the bank. And the first thing out of his mouth was not, so what kind of a deal can you get us? No, wasn't a positive statement. First thing out of his mouth, he null and voided every opportunity by these few words. He said, you're not going to be able to get him credit, are you? I was listening. I mean, I, I had to hide my face. I couldn't believe that he said that. This is your friend. You're trying to speak up for your friend to a man who can make the decision, who also happens to be your friend. And you cancel the whole thing with your mouth. And of course, the guy just agreed with him. No, I won't be able to. I couldn't believe it. I said, wait, 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 wait. You were supposed to talk on behalf of your friend, not against your friend. See, we don't realize. We don't go somewhere and say, uh, I really came to apply for credit, but you're not going to be able to give it to me, are you? Uh, um, I, I, I can't even voice how some people speak 
because I have done everything in my power to stay away from that negative kind of speech. See, when God tells me he's going to do something for me, I just leave it there and that settles it. Now, he may do it today. He may do it next week. He may do it next year. Or like he did when he gave me the dream about having my first brand new car. When I was maybe around 43 years old when I had that dream, I believed it and I left it. But it didn't happen till I was 50. Seven years down the road. 50. It happened. What happened with Abraham? He didn't see the, the fruition of his blessing, the promise from God. It was almost a hundred years down the road. But the promise came true. He had his own son, didn't he? See, God is true to his promise. We're not always true to our faith. Think about that. So when we don't believe, we either spit out negative de uh, declarations or we act negatively. We act a fool. We let our tempers flare. We let our tongues flat and go anywhere they want to go because we got the right to be upset. Look what they did to me. Look what they didn't do. Look how they backstabbed me. Look what they said about me behind my back. I saw what you did. I heard what you did. You think I wasn't going to find out. Some things you need to leave alone. The battle is not yours. It's the Lord's. But no, you want to fight your own battles because you like to fight. You like to throw a punch or two every once in a while. Keeps life exciting, doesn't it? Some of you like to argue. You argue somebody down to the ground till they're as flat as a coin and you walk away feeling like, hey, I got it going on. Look what I did to them. But God ain't happy. You happy. Your flesh is happy. Your pride is happy. But God ain't. God is very disappointed. His spirit is grieved because of how you just behaved. So my question to you is how high will your attitude take you or how low will your attitude bury you? How far will you go? How far will you allow yourself to go? Yeah. See, we have to be very careful because I know I used the example before, like a helium balloon. You know, um, the Bible says, lay aside every sin and the weight, says weight for a reason. Every sin and the weight that so easily besets you and run with patience the race set before you. See, when you allow too many weights to hang on you, your anger, your attitude, your pride, your resentment, your mouth, your doubts, your fears, your anxieties, and the list goes on. What you end up doing is as high as you could be soaring, those weights are neutralizing that height and bringing you back down. So when you thought you were getting ready to soar high, you can't soar. You, you put a bunch of weights on a bird, I don't care how hard they flap, they cannot fly because their wings are only meant to carry a certain amount of weight to fight against that wind. And some of you have got way too much weight on you. You got way too much flesh on you. Now you look at me, I'm a big woman. There are some things I won't try to do. I'm not going to jump four steps down. I might break a knee because there's a whole lot of weight landing on these, on these knees. I'm not going to be stupid. But see, some of you, you take leaps and bounds and you jump thinking that, oh, you can jump as high as you want. 
But when you come back to the ground, baby, damage is done because you didn't realize that all that weight you're carrying on you is doing more damage than good. All those attitudes, all those thoughts, those negative feelings, those feelings of spite and resentment, that bitterness is doing more harm than good. And when you think you're going up, God shows you, nope, you're right back down on the ground where you started. Because God ain't going to take no junk but so high. See, he doesn't want you carrying your mess with you. He wants you to shed every sin and the weight. He wants you to shed it, not take it with you. There will be no evil in heaven. So we're shaving off while we're here on the face of this planet as one of the purposes for being born. To shave it off, baby. Get rid of it. Listen, help me, Father, with this, please. See, a lot of times, you know, we go through life and we wonder, why can't I get along with her? Why can't I get along with him? Why does he rub my last nerve? Hmm. Why is she looking at me like that? Mm -hmm. I saw how they hesitated. See, see, they don't mean what they saying. So you got suspicion on top of fear, on top of anger, on top of malice, on top of attitude, and it's all mingling up into a nasty minestrone of sin. And you wonder why God didn't give you that promotion. You wonder why God didn't open that door and give you that job. You wonder why God didn't give you that pastorate over there. Why God didn't give you that, that supervisory position. Number one, broken people break people. Hurt people hurt people. Damaged people do damage to people. See, the more damaged you are, the more damage you will do. In the Old Testament, it talks about, when God talks about people getting into ministry, that means they're handling not only the things of the, of the altar, they're handling people. And it talks about they can't have a withered hand. They can't be lame. They can't have physical, uh, it's, it's all an allegorical principle. They cannot be physically challenged. Why? If I have a withered hand and I'm trying to wash dishes, half the dishes will probably be broken unless I have a device. But back then they didn't have devices, did they? Think about it. When you're broken, when there's something damaged inside of you, some of you can't get close to people. Some of you can't let people get close to you because you're damaged. So instead of going to God to undo the damage, you go to people and do more damage, don't you? Think about it. And then you wonder why that marriage didn't work out, why you didn't get married, why you didn't get this, why you didn't get that, why that fell through. Trust me, it's not always the devil, it's you. Let me share an example. Let's talk about me and my business. Talk about me and my flesh, my sin. When I first started dating my husband, this is more of an insightful, introspective, reflective type message. So if you want to shout, you got to go hear somebody else. I'm not, I'm not going to do that for you today. I was dating my husband. I was going through a season of inner healing. I was going to a lot of inner healing sessions and classes and all kind of workshops. And I mean, I was going to church like five days a week, five nights, six nights a week, as often as I could get there. I was there because they were having renewal services in the mid nineties at Pasadena Harvest Rock. Now, as I was going, I was also dating my husband. And when we first started dating, 
he would say things or look a certain way or do something. And because I'm very observant, I would look at him and I would ask him, did I do something that bothered you? And he's like, what? And I'm like, uh-oh, now he's irritated. Am I irritating you? What are you talking about? And I'm like, oh, okay, let me just hush. I'm messing up. I don't know. I think I bother him. I think I annoy him. I'm going through all this trying to analyze, you know, what is the dynamics of this, you know, where is this relationship going, if anywhere. Time goes on, he'll say, oh, you know, we'll have a conversation. He'll say something. And I'll be like, oh, did I just rub you the wrong way? What? <laughs> I, he's trying to figure out what the heck am I talking about? I'm trying to figure out why is he so annoyed by me? Something's wrong. He's not talking about it. He's not being real with me. Hmm. There was a period when the Lord led me to break up with him. It wasn't for his sake, it was for my sake. I continued the inner healing. Check it out. I continued the inner healing. When I finally, it was like a light went on. Ding! And I realized God had done a deep work. So we dealt with rejection. This is what the Lord's dealing with in me. Rejection, fear of what people think about me, insecurities. Oh yeah. Oh, it was, it was, it was knee deep, baby, how far the Lord had to go to do this deep work. And this is years of pain that happened from my childhood. Now, during this time, He's off doing his thing. I'm doing my thing. No connection, no contact, no conversations, nothing. The Lord let me know he was going to get back in touch with me. But my sign that God was in charge of it was he would only get back in touch with a marriage proposal. Other than that, I wouldn't talk to him because I knew God had separated us for a reason. And I thought it was permanent, honestly. So when we hook back up, to make a long story short, and all the different interactions went on, he had already asked me to marry him, all that had gone down, and now we're starting to go over his different friend's house and his family, he's introducing me, letting everybody know. He, you know, we started a, a premarital counseling with the pastor, of our church and all of that was going on. So we're on the way, getting ready to get married within months. I noticed something, check it out, check this out. Some of the same things, some of the same reactions that had me, oh, what did I say wrong? I'm getting on his nerves. What, what, did that annoy you? Is that, you know, all of that crap. You know what I found out? He wasn't the one tripping. I was. I didn't have any of those issues. I didn't have any worries. I didn't have any of those fears. None of those questions came to mind. I looked at him and I was like, oh my goodness. And I'm thinking to the Lord, me and the Lord, right? A little side talk going on. That was me tripping all that time. I could look at him and tell he wasn't trying to say anything. I could look at him and tell he wasn't. That was all me. Oh, my goodness. I could have ruined the chances of that relationship had I had my fears turn my attitude nasty. I would have been reacting to nothing and soured what could have been a beautiful relationship based on my own doggone insecurities and fears. Think about it. Think about it. But no, I went to God to undo all this damage. And as a result of God undoing the damage, I was able to have a successful, happy marriage and relationship with a wonderful man 
that didn't have little underhanded digs and little snide remarks, none of that. He didn't need his snide remarks and I didn't need my fears. And we got along just fine because I got me out of the way. What are you doing with you? Are you getting you out of the way or are you all always in the way? Your mouth, your attitude, your feelings. Come on now. That's why you got to go to God. See, you know, when we go to church, we're going to hear how to get saved, how to stay saved, how to witness, how to come to church and pay our tithes, uh, how to be faithful, how to treat each other and all that. Yeah. But what we don't hear much about is dealing with you. Get you out of the way. Most of our biggest problems in life is me, myself, and I. It's not her. It's not him. It's not my brother or sister, but me, Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Take responsibility for the things in life that you have jacked up because of your own scars. And instead of living with your scars and managing your scars, which you're not doing a great job with, go to God and get that crap gouged out of you so you can enjoy the life God gave you and not resent every moment. Okay, I'm done shouting. I'm not trying to beat you up. I'm trying to lift you up. Lift your eyes to the hills from whence cometh your help. Your help comes from the Lord. Psalms 121, you have got to look to God. Every problem, every issue, every shortcoming, every fear, every insecurity, every problem you have with this one, every problem you have with that one, every problem they have with you, or so as you take it, take that to God. See what he'll tell you. Start asking questions. And you'd be surprised the answers you start getting. God bless you as you seek God rather than beat people. Seek God. God bless you.